in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you.
Thank you, Father. We worship you this morning. Father God, our hearts are before you. We thank you. We thank you. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Father God. And so that I know that most of you, or at least a lot of you, have your Bibles, because I just saw them. <laughs> you can turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 5. We're just reading one verse today. Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 29. And here's what it says. It says, Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep all my commandments, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Father, as we hear your heart this morning, we just pray that you would convey by your Spirit what you would want us to know into our heart and into our mind, that we may become more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so you don't have to look very far these days to notice that there's a lot of grief going on in the world. I just talked about that pedestrian bridge coming down and there's other things. There's, there's genocide going on in Syria right now. There's starvation going on in Africa and other places around the world right now. 
There is terrorism going on globally around the world right now. And of course, the school shooting in Parkland, Florida, that took 17 human lives on a day where students and teachers should have just been focusing on assignments and tests and extracurricular activities. And as we focus just for a moment on the people from that devastating event in Parkland, Florida, we can certainly imagine the hearts of those who are going through such difficult hardships and heartaches. We can certainly imagine the thoughts of those who lost loved ones in tragedies such as this. I think back to a number of years ago as we we think about the reactions of people who have lost someone and, and the trauma and the shock that people go through. In November of 2000, there was a fellow by the name of Chris Swinimer that lived on the south shore of Nova Scotia and he owned, he started in 1975 and, and owned this courier company. And I had just become the pastor of that church. He was on the board. He led worship. I started pastoring in October, and on November the 20th, I got a phone call at 7.30 in the morning from the dispatcher of Shore Courier saying, I think that Chris has been in a fatal car accident on the 103. He says, I'm not sure yet, but I'm just calling you because that's what I'm hearing over the scanners. And I'm pretty sure it's Chris. Chris Swinimer had six children with his wife, Shirley. Between the ages of, at that time, I think they were between the ages of seven and 19. And the unique situation about Chris and Shirley is that it was interesting to see them all walk into church on Sunday. And as Shirley would walk in, there would be someone holding her arm because Shirley developed some kind of a disease, an eye disease, and in her early 20s, just after she was married, she lost all of her sight and only retained some peripheral vision, which was very blurry. And so every morning, walking into church, somebody had her by the arm and would walk her up to the drum set. And she would sit there and she'd be playing the drums. On the day of the visitation, I was present with the family. And because Shirley was blind, she could not identify his body by sight. And so I was there when her sister-in-law, Joni, walked her in by the arm and she walked over to the open casket and she placed her hand on Chris's face and his nose and his chin. And the sound that came out of her, the sound of mourning and hurt and grief as her legs buckled, was something I had never heard before. She had lost her husband, the love of her life, and was now faced with the future of raising a family on her own being blind. And I'm sure as Shirley was thinking on that day, and I'm sure as she has thought many days since, I'm sure that she would have said something like this, Oh, if I could only see Chris again. Oh, if I could only see my husband again. Oh, if he could only be here for his family again. And as I was watching this past week and and the bridge collapse and the school shooting and, and, and seeing and hearing about these people who were mourning, I'm sure that thought was going through their mind as well. Oh, if I could only see my son again. Oh, if I could only see my daughter, my husband, my friend again. 
And some of you here, I'm sure, have had the very same thought go through your mind. If I could only see my husband again. If I could only see my son again. If I could only see my loved one again. It's gone through your mind. It's gone through your heart, I'm sure. And as people convey this kind of thought, as it it processes in our minds, here's the message that we're actually conveying. The message is, is that it's a cry of desperation. It's a cry of longing for something so deeply. And I think that's what Shirley's sound was as she placed her face and, and, and could feel the features of his face but couldn't see him. It was a longing to be able to just one more time before the casket closed to be able to see his face again. And sometimes words can hardly express what is going on in our hearts. It's a cry that demonstrates grief. It's a cry that demonstrates sorrow. For a people who have such a longing in their hearts for loved ones. And today as we look to the Word of God, today we read about this same kind of longing this same kind of desperation, this same type of sorrow, this same kind of grief. But this time, it's not a cry of desperation from the hearts of people who are experiencing loss. This time, it's a cry from the heart of God as He mourns over His creation. It's a cry that is demonstrating a longing for the best in His children. It's a long that is demonstrating a desire to be close to His children and for His children to be close to Him. In fact, I believe there's no other verse in the entire Bible that expresses the longing and desire from God in quite the same way as Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 29 does. Oh, that they would have such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep my commandments, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Now, as in with social media, if, if, you're, if you have a cell phone, if you have Facebook, if you have email, any type of written communication can sometimes cause difficulty in trying to discern emotion. If you look at a Facebook message, you look at a text, it's like, are they angry? Are they upset? Are they... You can't tell because it's only words. Unless you put a little smiley face icon after, then you know, okay, well, they're happy. <clears throat> but in Scripture, because it's a written word, whenever a statement is supported by the word, oh, It's always followed by and represents a statement of desire or longing. And I suppose that we're reminded of the feelings of a parent towards a child and how they deeply desire the very best for them at all times. And so parents, grandparents, I'm sure these thoughts would go through your mind, oh, I hope they're doing well. Oh, I hope that They like their job. Oh, I hope that they're passing their tests. Oh, I hope if they have some type of sickness, oh, I hope that they're feeling better. We have those same types of sentiments. And the problem is, even though we want the best for our children, sometimes children go astray. Sometimes children do the wrong things at a young age or even when they're older. Sometimes children make poor choices. And as a result, children can find themselves in very troublesome situations that can be self-inflicted. You see, because children can make choices that will find them in poor relationships. 
Children can make choices that will cause them to develop poor lifestyles. It can bring them to places of addiction when they make poor choices. It can lead them into places of disobedience when they make poor choices. And it can even lead them to a life and an attitude of selfishness if they make poor choices. But in spite of how bleak things may look at times, in spite of of how desperate the situation can be, despite how, how much trouble a young person, a child can find themselves in, how much difficulty a son or daughter may experience, a good parent, a loving parent, will never give up their deep desire and longing for the best for their child. No matter what a child may face or find themselves in, as a parent, a good parent will always desire the best for their children. See, because no matter how old the child is, no matter how difficult the situation The oh, if only never leaves. That sentiment that comes before the heartfelt thought, oh, if only, that never leaves. And God is so much like that loving parent. Because even though every child of God has the free will to choose and to choose poorly, God will never give up hope on them. God will never give up hope on His children. God will never stop loving His children. God will never stop longing to be close to His children. God will never stop desiring the best for His children. We may develop an attitude in our lives to a point where when somebody fails and fails over and over again and they make wrong, wrong choices, we at some point may just stand back and say, well, I warned them. Too bad. But I don't believe God ever reaches that point. He always desires the best. He always longs for closeness. In fact, he he really wants to do more than just love his children. He wants to support them. In fact, in 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord look to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal, are loyal to him. Loyalty is a strong word. It's a word that describes unconditional love and commitment. And sometimes it's a word that the animal world demonstrates better than humans. This is our dog, Sammy. (laughs) And we are so pleased, sitting over with Wanda, is Val. Val lives in Belleville. And Val drove from Belleville to Renfrew today to come and see Sammy because Val gave Sammy to us. And we love Sammy. And I have no doubt that when Val comes to the house for lunch after, Sammy's going to run up and, and, and be bouncing all around and, and whining and, 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 and crying and, and licking your hand. And it's, I'm looking forward to that. Because animals are loyal. Even when they're not always happy. You see, when you have a dog, you sometimes have to get their nails cut. And so we brought Sammy a couple of weeks ago to a groomer to get her nails cut. But Sammy, she doesn't like her paws touched. Right, Val? She doesn't like her paws touched. And so the clip, Sammy didn't want to have anything to do with that. So the groomer came up with this idea. (laughs) 
They call it a hammock. I don't imagine they sleep too much in it, though. But you get the idea that Sammy couldn't do anything about anything going on at that point. And so the groomer took, was able to take the paws, and I stood beside, and I was petting Sammy's head and saying, it's okay, it's okay. And you would expect when an animal is going through something that they don't like, that when it's finished, they'll kind of walk off. It's like, I don't like you anymore. Right? But animals are loyal. Because as soon as I let Sammy out of that hammock, she got down and she started running around. Her tail is just a wagon like that. And she's jumping up and her ears are perked and she comes over and licks my hand. That's, that's understandable. And then she goes to the groomer and starts licking the groomer's hand. I'm thinking, that's the one that just put you in the hammock. <laughs> See, because animals tend to show loyalty even better than humans do. But loyalty is a strong word, and it's also the same word that we use in our relationships with people. See, because we need to be loyal to our spouses. We need to be loyal to our children. We need to be loyal to our brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to be loyal to our friends. Because God is looking to support those who are showing loyalty, not just to Him, but to everyone. And when we use the word loyalty in a spiritual sense, we sometimes use the word faithful. And God desires loyalty, and we could also say that God desires faithfulness. And the problem is, is that we live in a world where there's a great deal of unfaithfulness. Whether it be from someone we know, to world leaders, to even TV evangelists. Unfaithfulness is present all around us. People are unfaithful in their relationships with others. And people are unfaithful in their relationship with God. And here are just a, a couple of things that hinder faithfulness. A couple of things that hinder loyalty. And the first one is this. Pride. Do you know that when I look for pictures to put in my PowerPoint, I'll put a word in and then it will show me a bunch of pictures. Do you know when I put the word pride in? I could not find a picture that didn't have a rainbow in it. And so I had to put pride slash Bible. And it brought me a scripture verse. So this is better anyway, right? Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. You see... Pride hinders faithfulness because it prevents forgiveness from occurring. Pride says, I'll never forgive that person. For what they did, for what they said, I'll never forgive them. Pride hinders faithfulness. Pride also prevents repentance from occurring. I didn't do anything wrong. I'm not the one to blame. I don't have to repent. I don't have to ask forgiveness. Pride hinders faithfulness. Here is another prideful statement. I don't know if you can see it or not. When someone apologizes by saying, I'm sorry that you feel that way. It's got the word I'm sorry in it, right? It's a clever, tricky disguise. Whenever someone comes to me or comes to you and says, I'm sorry you feel that way. What they're actually saying is, I'm sorry you're wrong. That's pride. You can say, it's unfortunate that you feel that way, or... 
I don't think the same way that you do. But to say, I'm sorry you feel that way is not an apology, but it's actually a demonstration of pride. You see, because the threat of appearing weak in front of someone causes us to be prideful. Remember him? Hey. Kind of the epitome of perfection on happy days. Or so we think. But in one episode, he did something, he said something, and he hurt Richie Cunningham. And, and Richie went up to the Fawns and, and, and explained about how it, it hurt and that it had some effects and that there were some consequences. And Fonzie came to the point where he started to feel a bit of conviction and remorse. But because he never ever felt that he was ever ever wrong in his life, when he went to say the words to Richie Cunningham, he went to Richie and he said, I'm I, I'm s-s-s-s-s. And, and I, I think this scene was happening in the bathroom at Al's, Al's diner. And after trying a few times, Fonzie's I'm s-s-s-s. Richie, he says, Fonzie, are you trying to tell me that you're sorry? And Fonzie goes, that's it. <laughs> because he couldn't say the words Because pride was so much a part of his life. You see, pride prohibits faithfulness from happening. Pride prohibits loyalty, forgiveness, repentance from occurring. And the longer that we hold on to grudges, the longer that we refuse to forgive, the longer we try to maintain our pride, the harder it will be to let it go. Because I believe that there are some people in this world who are holding on to pride that when they come to Jesus Christ, they come to Him on their knees and say, I'm And They have a hard time getting the words out. They have a hard time repenting and therefore, they have a hard time being forgiven by a loving and gracious Savior. The more difficult it will be as we have pride to be faithful to people, and to be faithful to God. C.S. Lewis is a wonderful author. He says, Pride is a spiritual cancer. It eats up the very possibility of love, contentment, or even common sense. He goes on to say, C.S. Lewis does, he says, it is actually a sign of our own insecurity and feelings of inferiority. It's those who have insecurities that have the most pride because if they show weakness, they feel that they are just exacerbating and promoting what's already inside. Pride makes us think that we are better than everybody else. And that destroys relationships. Ever been around a know-it-all? Ever try to talk with them or get close to them and eventually you just kind of back away? Pride builds up walls between family and friends and that too destroys relationships. Pride causes us to be unfaithful to God and it destroys our relationship with Him And it causes him to say this. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep my commandments that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Another way that we show unfaithfulness to God is by speaking evil or criticizing others. There's a story of of two boys on a playground. One day they were discussing, they were talking about a classmate. And, and, and one of the boys, in a very critical way, said, he's no good at sports. 
And the other boy looked at him and said, yeah, but he always plays hard and he's very, very fair. Yeah, yeah, well, well, he's not very smart. Yes, but, the other boy said, he really studies hard and reads a lot. Well, yeah, but have you ever noticed how, how, how old and ragged his clothes look? Yeah, but they're always clean. And every time a negative observation was, was spoken by one boy, it was countered with a positive observation by the other boy. So much so that the, the critical boy got frustrated and decided to leave. Because he knew that whatever he said that was negative was going to be countered with something that was positive. And so the question we need to ask ourselves is this. Which of these two are you? If you were those children in the playground, would you be speaking the words to tear someone down or would you be speaking the words to build someone up? Do you engage in critical speaking to tear apart people? Or do you frustrate critical people by always speaking well of others? I'll tell you this, that one of these, you know that song from the children, so one of these things is not like the other. These are totally different approaches. One is being faithful and pleasing to God. And the other one causes God to say this. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep my commandments. That it might be well with them and with their children forever. You see, God is desperate. God is longing for faithful people. God is longing for those who are willing to keep His commandments. God is longing for ones who will love Him with all of their heart, all their soul, all their mind, all their strength. Because He wants to strengthen and support those whose hearts are completely faithful and loyal to Him. And you see, God's faithfulness does not only call the ones with natural, strong abilities. We all know the people who can speak well and can sing well and can maybe their head is good with numbers and they can do this or they can do that and and they just wow people with their ability. God does not only call those with ability. But here's what we need to understand. God, who is faithful to us, gives ability and He gives power and He gives strength to those who are faithful to His calling. In other words, if God's tugging on your heart and saying, I'd like you to take a step of faith and do this for my kingdom, and you think to yourself, oof, I've never done that before. That's not my thing. But you feel that tug? I can guarantee you that if you take that step of faith, you will receive strength, you will receive power, you will receive ability to do things beyond you could ever imagine you could do in His strength. I'm going to invite the worship team to come and join me on the platform again. And if you could play softly through that last song, Oh, the Blood of Jesus. As I close with this story, this is General Eisenhower. And as the story is told, it says once he rebuked one of his generals for referring to a soldier as just a private. He's just a private. General Eisenhower rebuked this general 
and reminded him that the army could function much better without its generals than it could without its foot soldiers. Here's what General Eisenhower, President Eisenhower said, and I quote, If this war is to be won, it will be won by privates and infantrymen who are willing to lay down their lives for our country. It's not about the ones with great ability and titles. It's about those who are willing to give of themselves. In the same way, the common, ordinary, faithful people are the backbone of the church. Those that are willing to give of themselves whatever abilities that they feel they have or they don't have, but they come to God and say, Here am I. Lord, use me. And I would venture to say this in similar words to President Eisenhower. If the world is going to be one for the kingdom, if the gospel is going to be taken to the lost, it will be done by those who are faithful, those who are dedicated, those who keep His commandments, and those who fear Him. Can I ask us to stand to our feet for a moment? If you are involved in any type of ministry here at the church, could I ask you just to come and stand at this altar for a moment? Any type of ministry. You serve on a committee, children, youth, women, counting in the office, sound room, music, choir, whatever ministry, board member, giving out cards for birthday and anniversaries. I'm looking for Corinne because Corinne every Sunday gives candy with a smile to our children of our church. Folks, you are the foot soldiers. And if this church is going to have an impact in this community, if souls are going to be one for the kingdom, we all have to work together to make that happen. May God bless each one and those that are, that are still in the chairs. And maybe God hasn't laid upon your heart a place of ministry yet. Please keep your heart open because God wants to use each and every one of us for His kingdom. Can we pray together? Father, I thank You for Your Word today. Lord, we thank You for being very honest with Your thoughts and with Your will when speaking to the children of Israel as they were finding different ways and making poor choices, you looked down upon your creation with such a desire and a longing for the best in them. You had such a desire that, that they would have such a heart within them to fear you, to follow your commandments, and you said that because you wanted things to go well in their lives, that things would be well with them and with their children. And Lord, you don't change. You have the same heart today. And you look down upon this congregation. You look down upon this body of believers. And your heart is the same. And you say, oh, that they would have a heart within them to fear and to follow and to obey because, oh, I want it to go so well with them and with their children. Lord, thank You for loving us. Thank You for reaching to us. 
And Lord, we ask that you would help for pride and criticism to take a back seat in our lives so that faithfulness and loyalty may take precedence and we may only focus on doing the work and the will of God our Heavenly Father.